Hey everyone, Ricardo here, and in this video I'm going to be showing you how to perform short circuit and protection coordination studies using the ETAP software. Now in a previous video I went over how to model a power system from scratch using the ETAP software. It's this video over here and I'll also leave a link in the description below. So make sure to check out that video first if you want to learn how to build the model from scratch. But in this video we're going to be focusing on how to run short circuit and protection coordination studies. Alright, so let's jump right into it. Let's see how we can run short circuit and protection coordination studies using the ETAP software. All right, so again, we're gonna be using this model that I have over here on the screen, which we developed in a previous video. So make sure to check out that video first if you wanna learn how to build this model from scratch. But what we're gonna do in this video is we're gonna do a short circuit study and a protection coordination study. So for building the model, you're going to be in what's called the edit mode, which is the one that I'm in right now. Now we can switch to the short circuit mode by clicking on this icon over here, which is sort of a lightning bolt. And again, this switches us to the short circuit mode. And in here is where we can run different short circuit studies. We can fault different buses in our power system model. We can run different types of faults and just overall do different types of short circuit calculations. All right, so the first thing that I wanna do over here is go to the study case. This is basically where we define how to run short circuit studies, which buses to fault and what standards to use and so forth. So let's go ahead and click on that. And that opens up this window over here. And here you have a list of the buses within your system that you're going to fault. In our case, I want to fault all the buses. So I've moved everything over here to the left where it says fault. But for example, if we didn't want to fault some of the buses in the system, we can just move it to this side over here. So for example, if I just want to fault the substation bus, I can select all of this, move it to this side. And then when I hit run short circuit, ETAP is not going to fault these buses that I have over here on the right. That's sometimes beneficial if you have a very large model with many, many buses. When you run the short circuit study, it might take a little bit of time for ETAP to run the calculations. And so if you're only interested in some of the buses, then you can just put those over here and not worry about the rest. And that'll just help speed up the calculation for the fault currents. Now, in my case, we have a fairly simple model. So I'm going to fault every single bus in the system. So I'm going to move everything over here to the left. And here you have other options. For example, you can select the transformer tab for the voltages that are going to be used during the study. So if you have a different tab position on your transformer, you can tell ETAP, don't use that, use the nominal tab instead. Or you can say, well, I use adjusted base kilovolt based on the tabs of the transformer if you have a different type other than the nominal tab. You can also select over here the standard that is going to be used for running the short circuit study. You can select IEC, you can select INC. You can also set the pre-fault voltage. So for example, right now I have it to 100% of the nominal KV for the pre-fault voltage. So again, there's many options over here. Typically you don't have to change this unless you wanna change something specific. For example, if you wanna use the IEC standard instead of the ANC standard for running your short circuit study. There's different options over here. I'm gonna leave all of those at default. The main thing over here again is that I wanna make sure that all the buses in the system are faulted. So now I'm gonna hit okay, and that's gonna take us back to our model, and everything over here is blank because we haven't run the short circuit study yet. Now the other thing that I wanna show you over here is that you have these three options for running the actual short circuit study. Over here, when you select maximum, what that does is it uses the subtransient reactants for any synchronous generators that you might have in your system, and it also accounts for contribution of motors during the first few cycles of a fault. So for example, in our model, if I click Max, now ETAP is gonna run the short circuit study. And you can see that there's some contribution coming back from the motors to a fault on this bus. That's because for the first few cycles during a fault, the motor is actually gonna back feed into the fault. Now that is gonna subside with time. So if you click over here, minimum, what this does is it runs a 30 cycle short circuit, meaning it's gonna tell you what the fault current levels are 30 cycles after the fault has happened. And that usually removes the contribution from any induction motors that you have in your system. And also it uses the synchronous reactants for any synchronous generators that you might have in your system. So it's basically like a steady state fault current level after all the transients have kind of decayed and you have a steady state fault. So just something to keep in mind, of course, you can have maximum and minimum values. For the most part, you're going to be using maximum values. And what I want to show you over here is, is this gives us the fault current levels for every bus at the substation in this case, or every bus in your model. Now, for example, I'm gonna zoom in over here to the substation bus, and you can see over here that the total fault current for a fault at this bus is 48,000 
amps or 48 Ka. ETAP typically displays current levels in Ka in kiloamps instead of just amps. So this is the total full current 48 Ka and it also shows us the contribution coming from each side of the system. So we can see that 32 Ka is coming from the transformer over here which of course comes from this utility equivalent and then we have about 8 Ka backfeed contribution from the induction motors and that of course all of that adds up to 48 Ka. Now one of the reasons why you might want to run a short circuit study like this is let's say for example that this is a switch gear this 13.8 kV bus is actually a switch gear that switch gear is going to have a rating of the amount of fault current that it can withstand during a fault so for example there might be a rating for this switch gear of 50 kA and you want to make sure that during the absolute worst case fault in that switch gear that you're not going to exceed the ratings of the switch gear that's one of the applications where you might want to run a short circuit study like this and just as another example, for example, I had a project in which we had two switch gear tied by a tie breaker. And we found out that if you paralleled the two transformers, the fault current level was too high for any one switch gear to withstand that. So we had to implement an interlocking system where the transformers could not be paralleled such that if there was a fault at the switch gear, we wouldn't exceed its rating. So that's just a typical scenario where you might want to run a short circuit study like this. Now the other thing over here is that this information that is being displayed is for a three-phase fault. So you can click on this icon over here and that's going to bring up this window over here. And when you run the short circuit study, ETAP actually runs all the different types of faults. So it runs three-phase faults, line to ground, line to line, and line to line to ground. And then you tell it what you want to display in the results. So in this case, I told it run the fault and display the three-phase values. Now I could also switch this to, let's say, for example, line to ground. And if you do that, ETAP gives you the option of selecting, okay, which current do you want to display? Do you want to display 3i0, which of course is very helpful for protection coordination, or do you want to display the phase values? In this case, let's say that I want to display 3i0, and then this would be the numbers. And of course, you can also change to line to line or line to line to ground. So for example, for line to line, I can select that and I can say, well, I want the phase values, not 3i0. So let's go ahead and click OK. And now I can see all the individual phase values. For example, the contribution from the transformer in this case would be zero kiloamps for A phase and 27.8 Ka for both B and C phases. Of course, in this case, we ran a B to C line to line fault. So it's just different types of results that you can display. Again, if you want to see the maximum fault current level, that's typically a three phase fault current. And you would select over here the max short circuit such that all the transients are taken into account. All right, so now let's move to protection coordination. And that is under this module over here, which is called start protection coordination. Let's go ahead and click on that. And again, we have our model over here where we have a utility equivalent. We have a transformer, substation bus, two feeders. What I wanna do for this example is show you how to do a protection coordination where we have an overcurrent element on this relay over here, which is an SCL487E that is implemented on the high side of the transformer. So it's gonna be reading the current off of this CT over here, and it's gonna implement an overcurrent that's both gonna protect the transformer and the substation bus. And then we're gonna coordinate that with this feeder one relay over here, and we're gonna display the curves and see how we can perform the coordination. Now I'm gonna skip this bus for this example, we're going to assume that that's just doing bus differential protection for this substation bus and it doesn't have overcurrent elements. In this case, the 51 or inverse time overcurrent element that we're going to be implementing here on the high side of the transformer would also provide backup for faults in the substation bus. And then we're going to coordinate that with the inverse time overcurrent element in the feeder relay over here. So let's go ahead and do that. Again, I have an SCL487E relay for the transformer and an SEL751 relay for the feeder relay. Now, again, I've gone ahead and modeled this and we showed that in the previous video, but this relay over here, of course, has two CTs, one on the high side and one on the low side. And again, the overcurrent is gonna be reading off of the high side CT. So let's go ahead and click on this SEL487E relay and we get this window over here. The first thing that I wanna do is to make sure that the input tab over here is set up properly. So this is where ETAP gets the information as to what CT to use for what element. 
In this case, let's say that we're just going to be implementing a phase over current element, and that's going to be reading the CT on the high side of the transformer. Now notice over here that it gives me two options, and that is of course because we have two CTs. This one at the top is called CT1, and this one at the bottom is called CT5. So when I go over here to the input tab, and I click on this dropdown, it gives me those two options. In this case, again, we want our overcurrent element to be on the high side CT. So I'm going to select CT1, and we can verify over here that that's 400 to 5 which of course is the ratio for this high side CT. Now I want to do the same thing for the feeder relays. So if I double click on this feeder one relay and I go to input and I select this dropdown, here of course we only get one option because there's only one CT that is wired into the relay. So we can just click on that. And again, it displays now here 2005. And if we go back to our model, we can see that, of course, that matches this number over here. So we've set up the CTs for each one of the relays. The next thing that I want to do is to enable the overcurrent elements on each one of the relays. So let's do the 47E first. Let's double click on this. And now I can go over here to OCR. And by default, there's a bunch of things here enabled. I'm going to disable all of this. Again, for this example, we're just going to do a phase over current element and for this relay specifically we're going to have both a 51p element so an inverse time over current element and an instantaneous over current element both are going to be phase elements so i'm going to disable negative sequence ground neutral and just leave the phase on and i'm going to have both inverse time and instantaneous now for this example i'm going to use u3 curves for the 51 elements i'm going to assume that this is a 5 amp ct and we have to select the pickup and the tam dial i'm going to leave those at default for now and let's go ahead and do the same thing for the instantaneous. That's going to be a 5 amp relay. So now I enable both 51 and 50, both phase elements. I'm going to click OK. Let's go to the feeder relay now and let's do the same thing. So if I go over here to OCR, again, I'm going to disable everything that is not a phase element. And in this case, it looks like everything by default is disabled for this relay. And let's go ahead and change this again to U3. 5 amps. And for the feeder, I'm not going to have an instantaneous element. So I'm going to uncheck the instantaneous box over here. All right. So what we've done here is we've told ETAP which CT to use for each relay. We've told it what kind of element, protection element we want. So now we can put this in a TCC, a time current characteristic plot, and do the coordination. So what I want to do here is you can select everything that you want to be included in the plot. So in this case, it's going to be the feeder all the way down to the load, this bus, and then everything over here, let's say up to the utility equivalent. And let's also include this relay and our feeder one relay was also included. So I've selected everything that I want to be included in my TCC plot. So once you do that, you can click on this button over here which is to create a star view. A star view is basically the TCC plot in ETAP. So let's go ahead and click on that. And now ETAP is going to create this plot and it's going to put everything that we selected into this plot, including all the equipment. So you can see over here that we have the damage curve, for example, for the transformer, for the cables, and then we have our elements over here that we enabled. So the first thing that I want to do over here is just select this one line over here and let me actually make that a little bit bigger just so it is easier to see and in here you can select that and then click on this button over here and that's going to make this one line view a little bit bigger just so that we can see where everything's at so again we selected everything down to the feeder let me move this transform over here and we're displaying here basically a one line of the curves that we're going to be displaying in our tcc plot so now i'm going to move that over here and typically I like to put this here on the bottom left just to kind of reference what's shown here on the plot. All right, now this is a little bit crowded over here. The reason for that is that we haven't actually set our overcurrent elements. So you can see that the curves are all the way down over here. That's just because we haven't actually put values in our settings. So let's go ahead and do that. The first thing that I want to do is select the pickup for our 
high side time over current element on the SEL 487E. Now to do that, we're gonna do a couple of things. One is that, and let me actually make this just one click bigger. Again, we know that we have a 400 to 5 CT on the high side of the transformer, and we have a 100 MVA transformer. Now the maximum rating for this transformer per standard is 166.67 MVA. So we want to select the pickup of our inverse time over current element on the high side of the transformer to be some margin above that value. In this case, I want that to be 25% above that value. And ETAP actually displays the full load amps for that MVA over here. So we can see basically that at 230 kV, 166 MVA equals 418 amps. So what I want to do for my 47E is I want to set the pickup of the time over current element to be 25% higher than that. So this number 418 times 1.25. And then of course we need to convert that to secondary amps based on the CT ratio that we have. So let's go ahead and do that again. That number is 418.4. And let me pull up my calculator over here. So again, we have 418.4. We're gonna multiply that times 1.25 to give us some margin above that value. And then I'm gonna divide that by the CT ratio for that overcurrent element, which in our case is 400 to five, which is 80. So I'm gonna divide this number by 80, and that gives me 6.54. I'm gonna round this to two decimal places. So our pickup is gonna be 6.54. Again, that equates to 25% above the maximum rating of the transformer that we have. And that's of course, because we wanna make sure that we don't trip on load. So 6.54, and now I can go into my relay over here and my pickup is gonna be 6.54. Let me go ahead and click OK. And now you can see how that curve moved from here all the way to here. Now the other thing that of course we wanna do is to set the time dial of this overcurrent element. You can actually drag the curve over here to any point on the curve and that's automatically going to update the time dial that's over here. So in this case, I move that curve all the way up and that gives me a time dial of 3.75. And let me actually go back to the plot. And the reason why I want that time dial is because we have the damage curve of the transformer down here and I wanna be just below that damage curve. So again, we selected the pickup based on the rating of the transformer to make sure we don't trip on load. And now the time dial, I'm gonna select it based on the fact that I wanna coordinate with the damage curve of the transformer, which is this one over here. So that gives me a pickup of 6.54. Let me actually move this down just a little bit to have a little bit more room in there. So I'm gonna select 3.7. And as you can see, that puts the curve for that 51 element on the high side of a transformer, just below the damage curve for the transformer to make sure we also protect the transformer. Now I also said that we want an instantaneous overcurrent element on this relay over here which right now is set to the default of 20 amps. And I actually want this to be instantaneous, so zero cycles for the delay. And to select that, we have to do two things. One is we need to run a fault on the low side of the transformer and make sure that we select the pickup such that that's above that value. And that is just to make sure that we don't trip instantaneously for a fault on the low side of the transformer. So if I go back over here to my model, what I can do from this star view is put this fault in here. And let me actually get rid of this. And again, this is the number that we saw before, 48 kA total, 32 kA contribution from the transformer. Now that's on the low side of the transformer. And again, remember that our relay is reading current off of this CT. So the contribution on the high side, basically at 230 kV in this case, is 1,924. So we wanna make sure that our setting for the instantaneous element is above that value with some margin, such that we don't trip for a fault here on the low side of the bus instantaneously. Because that of course would create miscoordinations with anything down here on the substation bus. Now the other thing that we wanna watch out for and that's better shown on the TCC is the fact that we have this inrush point for the transformer. What that is, is when you first energize the transformer, you're gonna see a spike in current, just because that's magnetizing the transformer. 
And so, of course, we want to make sure that we don't trip for that because otherwise that would mean that every time we energize the transformer, the instantaneous element is going to trip back out. And of course, that's something that we don't want. So two things for your instantaneous overcurrent element. One is, again, you want to make sure that you don't trip for a low side fault, but also you want to make sure that you don't trip for inrush. So what I can do for that is I can double click on this transformer. I can go to the rating and I can see that the OA rating, the self-cooled rating for this transformer is 100 MVA. That in current at 230 kV is 251 amps. And a typical rule of thumb for inrush is that the worst case inrush is going to be 12 times the OA rating of the transformer. So basically, if we take that number, multiply that times 12, that's going to be our worst case inrush. And then we can add some margin on top of that. So let's go ahead and do that. I can say, well, I'm going to take 251, which is our OA rating current, multiply that times 12 to get my worst case inrush. And then I'm going to add some margin on top of that. I'm going to do 20% above that. And then, of course, we need to convert that back to secondary amps for the relay. So if we have a 400 to 5 CT, we're going to divide that by 80. And that gives us 45.18 amps. So my instantaneous element then is going to be 45.18. So we can go back to the 47E relay. So let's double click on that. And I'm going to change this number to 45.18. Now, the other thing that I want to do in this step is notice over here how we have a different curve for the 51 element, the inverse time over current, and the instantaneous over here. I want to combine those two. So I'm going to click this box over here, which says block TOC by IOC and combine for this level. What that does is it's just going to combine the two curves into one. It just makes it easier to read. So let's go ahead and click OK. And now you can see that we have just one curve that is above inrush. And then we also calculated that that was above the worst case fault for a low side transformer fault. So now we're done with our 51P and 50 elements on the transformer. The next thing that we need to do is to select the settings for this feeder relay and then do the coordination. So in this case, we have a 40 MVA load. And let me actually make this a little bit bigger. So our load on our feeder is this one over here, 40 MVA. And if we calculate 40 MVA at 13.8 kV, which is the voltage on the low side of a transformer, we can see that that's equal to 1673 amps. And that's actually shown also over here on the load configuration. So again, 40 MVA at our voltage of 13.8 kV is 16.73. So we're gonna do something similar as to what we just did for the transformer. I can just take that number, 1673, add margin to it. In this case, I'm gonna do 25%. So times 1.25, that gives us the worst case load current for our feeder. And then I need to convert that to secondary amps in terms of the relay that is doing the protection. In this case, it's this feeder relay, which has a 2000 to 5 CT. So I'm gonna divide this number by 400, which is 2000 divided by five. And that's gonna give me 5.23 amps for the pickup of this overcurrent element. So I'll still click on this and I'm gonna select this pickup to be 5.23. And that of course moves our curve to the right. Now ATAP auto adjusted the view over here because it sees that now everything's kind of shifted to the side. So it changed the scaling over here. So let me actually double click over here. So you can just double click on the background of the curve and go to access. And you can see over here the auto scale and current multiplier. Let me uncheck that and I'm gonna move that to 10. And you can see that that moved the curves over here to the right. I just want to do that so that it's a little bit easier to see the curves over here. Now you can see that with the default time dial, of course, that's way down over here. I don't want that. What I want is to make sure that I have at least 0.3 seconds of coordination with this curve over here. Now to do that, you can select this tool over here, which gives you the time difference. And then you can click on the curves that you want to show the difference between. So I'm going to click on this curve. Now click on this curve. And you can see that I put this marker over here and it's telling me what the difference is between this point and this point. It displays that over here, it's saying that it's one second. Now this cursor over here is actually just for display. This one here on the on the left is at which point on the curve we're coordinating at. 
So for example, if I move this to the left, you can see that this number changes to be bigger because of course the difference between this curve and this curve gets bigger. If I move it over here, that number gets smaller. So what I want to do here is basically I want to coordinate these two curves at the worst case point. In this case, that's going to be right before the instantaneous picks up. So over here. And now I know that the difference between these two points is 0.64 seconds. And now I can click on my feeder curve and just drag that up so that our difference is about 0.3 seconds. And this actually is not auto update. And let me move that here. And I just need to refresh that. So now we have a coordination time over here between these two curves of roughly 0.46 seconds. I want that to be a little bit tighter. I want that to be 0.3 seconds. So what I can do here again is I can either just click and drag over here or I can change the time dial over here. And let's say for example, that we have 3.6, click OK. And now you can see that the difference between these two curves at this point over here is 0.326. So let me zoom in a little bit more and let's move that right before the instantaneous picks up. So over here, that's roughly 0.3 seconds. That's the number I wanted to see between my two curves. Basically what this means is again, the worst case coordination time between the transformer curve and the feeder curve is 0.3 seconds, which of course is over here at this point. Now, lastly, of course, you want to make sure that your curves are displayed organized. So what I like to do over here is one, move this to the left such that it lines up with the other cursor. And then I also want to make sure that my settings are displayed. So I'm going to move just all these labels over here. And one thing that you can do over here is you can select what information to display. So you can double click on the background of the curve. That's going to bring up this view. And I can see here over here to devices. I'm going to go to my relay, which is the T1 relay and the feeder one relay. So if I go over here to T1 relay, go to label, label setting, hit apply. And now that displays the settings over here. And I'm going to do the same thing for the feeder relay. Let's go over here to feeder one relay. So this one over here, go to the label tab and click on label setting, hit apply. And again, that displays the settings down here. So this is just a nice way for you to see the settings that you've applied on the same curve. You can also do the same thing for, for example, the inrush point over here. You can tell it, I want to show the current down here, the current value, basically what point is this on the curve. And again, typically I just try to clean this up a little bit more just to make it a little bit easier to read, display this, maybe get rid of some of these curves over here that it's not really necessary for you to display. For example, the full load amps of the feeder load. Typically I'll remove that, the lock rotor current for the feeder load as well. You can select what information you want to show on your curve. And that just depends on your application and just the information that you want to display. But here basically we coordinated the overcurrent elements on the high side of a transformer with the feeder. We skipped the bus relay because we said for this example, that doesn't have an overcurrent element on it. But of course, if you had a relay here on the main breaker, for example, you would just do the same process. You would have another curve here in between the high side overcurrent and the feeder overcurrent. And you would change the time dials such that you have at least 0.3 seconds of coordination between each one of the curves. So you would have a curve that looks like this, then another curve for the main breaker. And this curve for the feeder would actually be a little bit further down so that you have 0.3 seconds between the feeder and the main, and then the main and the high side overcurrent on the high side of the transformer. All right, so that's how you run short circuit and protection coordination studies using the ETAP software. If you want to learn more about power system protection and control, make sure to check out our online courses where we go over different types of protection schemes in a lot of detail. And as always, if you like this video, make sure to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel for more videos about power engineering and power system protection and control. And we'll see you in the next one.